everybody. First Samuel chapter number 27 will be our text this morning. First Samuel chapter number 27. It's good to see so many faces I know. A lot of faces I don't know here. It's good to see Mrs. Gonzalez, my fifth and sixth grade teacher. I told my wife last night, I said, I didn't get to see Mrs. Gonzalez. And she goes, I talked to her. She was right behind you. And I was so mad. And I looked out and I saw her here. And uh, boy, I tell you when, you, when you, when you leave a place and you come back home, it's good to see familiar faces. It's encouragement. First Samuel chapter number 27. I'm going to preach a message that I've preached at my church. Uh, I've been going through the life of David and pulling messages out. Began to pray, asking the Lord which one he had me preach. I believe this is the message. And uh, obviously the devil must not want me to preach it this morning. <laughs> I can't, can't get it. So I finally found a, 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 the, I spent a lot of time working on it. And uh, last night and this morning, and uh, unfortunately, I can't get it. So I'm going to preach the message that my church got. So let's pray, and then we'll get into this message this morning. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have of being called the sons of God. We thank you for the privilege that we have of the forgiveness of sins, the inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have of heaven one day. I pray, Lord, for each and every person who... Oh, Lord, is struggling right now in life. I pray that you would give them encouragement from this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Hans Christian Andersen, the notable Danish author. Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon. Amanda Beard, the American swimmer and Olympic gold medalist. Holly Berry, the well-known American actress, Beyonce, Terry Bradshaw, the comedian, Johnny Carson, the musician, Johnny Cash, Winston Churchill, Calvin Coolidge, Agatha Christie, Charles Darwin, Princess Diana, Ellen DeGeneres, John Denver, Charles Dickens, Ken Griffey Jr., Zach Granke, Tipper Gore, Ernest Hemingway, Hulk Hogan, <laughs> Billy Joel, Martin Luther King Jr., Stephen King, Lady Gaga, John Lennon, Abraham Lincoln, David Letterman, Michelangelo, Mozart, Isaac Newton, Conan O'Brien, Gwyneth Paltrow, Dolly Parton, John D. Rockefeller, Ronda Rousey, J.K. Rowling, Charles M. Schultz, Britney Spears, Charles Spurgeon, Frank Sinatra, Taikashki, or how do you say that guy? Mark Twain, Mike Tyson, Joey Votto, Mike Wallace, Jerry West, Robin Williams, Oprah Winfrey, all of those people including many more, appear on the same Wikipedia page. You may wonder, what common denominator do all these authors and astronauts and athletes, musicians, comedians, politicians, preachers, statesmen, talk show hosts, scientists, business executives, and artists share? The Wikipedia page is a list of people that had a major depressive disorder. They all battled depression. And when you turn your eyes off of Wikipedia and onto the scriptures, the list of names only continues. Moses, Job, Elijah. Jeremiah, Solomon. And of course, we end with the one we're going to study today, 
David. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 27, we see David at one of his lowest points in his life, if not the lowest. Now we have some indication from this chapter as to how depression both starts and works in a person's life. But this morning my aim is to expose the origin of depression. I pray that God helps all of us this morning. Before we examine this particular verse, I want us to familiarize ourselves with the setting. David is around 28 years old. About 13 years prior, he was just a humble shepherd boy at the age of 15 years old when God told the prophet Samuel to go and anoint him to be the next king. Eventually, Saul would hire this instant national hero after David kills Goliath in that epic battle of the ancient past. But Saul's admiration of this young conqueror soon converts into envy. And before you knew Saul tries to kill David on numerous occasions. In fact, there are at least 15 attempts on David's life, and that's not including the passages of Scripture that tell of Saul hunting David every day. As a result, David has fled his home, and everywhere he flees, King Saul is chasing him, leaving a trail of blood David grieves over. Innocent people were dying because of David. And the word gets around all of Israel that their national hero was now their national enemy. The people who once sang David's praises were now betraying him and his location to Saul everywhere he went. Soon, David is living as a wild man, dwelling in caves and in the wilderness. And it's here, in this awful condition, that 400 men who were in the same condition as David come and join themselves themselves to David. 1 Samuel 22, verse 2 says, Everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Now, if caring for these 400 men, along with their families, was hard enough, by the next chapter, these 400 men had turned into 600 men, But instead of shirking his responsibility over this rough group of guys, David becomes a captain over these men, and he actually leads them to fight the Philistines, and he saves them. He saves an Israelite city, Keilah, from the hands of the Philistine. But immediately after saving these people, he has to flee the very city he saved because they were going to betray him to King Saul. And he was in hot pursuit after David. After more betrayals and a series of betrayals, David finds himself in a cave when the first favorable opportunity falls into David's lap. King Saul had entered the cave that David and his men were hiding in, and he was alone without his bodyguard. David could have killed Saul. All of David's men were whispering into the ears of David, kill him, this is your chance. But David would not kill the Lord's anointed. Instead, David would wait upon the Lord, and instead he would only cut off a portion of the garment of King Saul to prove to King that he had had spared his life when it was in his power to kill it. This appeased King Saul for some time, and for a brief period, David had some reprieve from being hunted. But as it is in the blood of a hound dog to chase a rabbit, so it was in the blood of King Saul to chase David. And we eventually find King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 26, with 3,000 chosen men of Israel down in the wilderness trying to kill David. But God protects him 
by causing a deep sleep to come over all of Saul's men, including the king himself. And David sneaks into the camp with his guard. And once again, circumstances favored the man after God's own heart. But he refused to kill the Lord's anointed for the second time, demonstrating great restraint. And instead of killing the king, he simply takes his spear and he takes his cruise of water to demonstrate to the king once more that he spared his life. Saul, again there, repents of his wicked deeds now in the dark hours, late in the night. And it was there at that moment, perhaps in the early morning hours of that same particular event, where David is now walking back home to his hideaway in the hills of the wilderness. Physically tired, emotionally drained, and spiritually weak. That we read 1 Samuel chapter 27 and verse 1. Immediately after sparing the king's life, David said, in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in the coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. Here in this verse, I believe we have a strong indication as to the origin of depression. The Bible says that David said, in his heart. And most people think that depression is caused by external circumstances or by bad happenings. But when you study the scriptures carefully, you'll find that while outside circumstances may be awful and incredibly difficult to deal with, a Christian can still live with the joy of the Lord in their life and with a peace that passes all understanding. Looking at David's Facebook timeline from a human perspective, you wouldn't see David posting on his wall pictures with a beautiful family. Instead, you see, you'd see his home divided, his wife given to another man. David would have probably posted Psalm 142, verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. You wouldn't see a picture of his beautiful house with granite countertops on Instagram. and said you would see a, a cave in the middle of a wilderness. David would have probably posted Psalm 142, verse 7, Bring my soul out of prison. You wouldn't see his family and friends celebrating his birthday on a Snapchat account. Instead, you would see 600 vagabonds forming the first ever homeless shelter in Israel. David would have probably posted Psalm 142, verse 1, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. You wouldn't see family vacations posted, but rather you would see David fleeing for his life. David would have probably posted Psalm 69 too. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters. You wouldn't see a countdown to coronation. Instead, you would see, as we read in 1 Samuel chapter 27 and verse 1, a countdown to death. From a human perspective, David could only write at the end of each post, hashtag cursed. But if you look at David's life through the eyes of faith, and from a divine perspective, David's Facebook timeline would have a whole different tone. Instead of focusing on King Saul's envy, and instead of focusing on his home being divided, you would read Psalm 2710, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Instead of highlighting the awful conditions of the cave or the miserable heat of the wilderness, you would read Psalm 18, verse 2 and 3, the Lord is my rock 
my fortress, my deliverer. Instead of posting desperate pictures of homeless people, you would see David's post in Psalm 145, verse 14, The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Instead of seeing a blurry picture of David fleeing from his enemy, you would read in Psalm 3, 3, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. Instead of wishing for death, you would see David's post in Psalm 36, verse 9. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light shall we see light. From a divine perspective, David could only write at the end of each post, hashtag blessed. You see, the Psalms are filled with both human and divine perspectives which makes me understand that depression is not caused by outside circumstances. That's why Job, who lost his wealth, who lost his children, who lost his health, who lost his reputation, who lost his friends, could say in Job 1.21, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, depression is not caused by outside circumstances. It's why the Apostle Paul, even though he had been in prison after they had tried to kill him, could write in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23 through 24, whereof I, Paul, now rejoice in my sufferings for you. You see, depression is not caused by outside circumstances. It's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 that we should glory in our tribulations. That's why the Apostle Peter could write in 1 Peter chapter 1 that the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold. You see, the scriptures have established a truth that outside circumstances are not the reason, they are not the origin of depression. Instead, David's depression originated on the inside. 1 Samuel 27 verse 1 says that David said, in his heart. And I want to warn all of us here and remind us what the Bible says about the heart. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful. You guys are familiar with Candy Sale? I grew up here. I've, I've been a part of too many of those things, okay? I was here for one day. They've already asked me to take somebody to go Candy Sale with them. I said, hey, I'm, I'm leaving today. <laughs> My sister, growing up in the academy, would go out and I'd take her with me and she would go in and she would say, hello, man, would you like to buy a delicious box of candy? And they were like, oh, you're so cute. How much is your candy? What is this for? She'd say, it's for my school, Fairhaven Baptist Academy. Oh, it's a Christian school. Are you a Christian? Yes, ma'am. What's your favorite Bible verse? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately looking. Who can know it? <laughs> I was like, Christian. <laughs> You should have seen that lady's face. Oh, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't get out of that place fast enough. That lady was physically demonstrating the response that most people who hear this truth give. But it is the truth. And we must learn it. Otherwise, depression will come, dig its foundation, and build a huge structure from within the heart. The heart cannot be trusted. It cannot be followed. It cannot be listened to. All it does is deceive you. And so many people have done so many things that they thought they would never do because of depression. You see, Jeremiah 17, 9 is so true. The heart is deceitful. That's why Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In David's case here, his heart had deceitfully convinced David, as it says in verse 1, I shall now perish one day 
by the hand of Saul. Now we know that that was a lie that the heart was telling David. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God had promised David through the prophet Samuel that he would be king over Israel. God had reminded David about that promise with the final words of Jonathan the prince in Israel in 1 Samuel 23 verse 7 where Jonathan says to David, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also my father knoweth. He had reminded David about this promise through his men in the city of Keilah. God had reminded David about this promise through Abigail, Nabal's wife. When he wanted to kill Nabal, she went out and stopped him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse 30, she pleased with David. And she says this, It shall come to pass concerning thee that thou shalt have a, uh, it shall come to pass that thou shalt have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. God had reminded David of his promise of being king by using the final words that King Saul spoke to him in the chapter previous in 1 Samuel 26, verse 25, where Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things and also shalt still prevail. Yet in spite of the promise of God and in spite of all the reminders of that promise from God, the heart was so deceitful that David had said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Will you hear me this morning? Let us not reason in our hearts. Do you have a big decision? Don't listen to your heart. Do you have struggles with friends? Don't listen to your heart. Are you lonely? Don't listen to your heart. Are you in a difficult financial situation trying to figure out how you're going to make it? Don't listen to your heart. Do you struggle with a relationship at home? Don't listen to your heart. It will only deceive you. It will only lead you down a road that you would rather not be on. Depression originates with you in the heart. In less than three years, if only David could have seen what Paul Harvey calls the rest of the story. I think he would have stopped, but he couldn't see it. He had no way of knowing that this was perhaps the final moment of temptation. And this moment because he couldn't see the rest of the story, looked awful. And the deceitful heart took advantage of these unfavorable circumstances. And it convinced David to do something that he wishes he never would have done. So what about my circumstances then? If depression originates in the heart, then what do you do with the circumstances that you are in? Well, understand something about circumstances. Outside circumstances force out what's inside the heart. Outside pressure reveals to you who you really are beneath the skin. It's why the Bible calls it the trial of your faith in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, you'll see that David had particularly two sets of circumstances that became a trial in his life. Dr. David Jeremiah points out uh, points both of these circumstances out in, t in, in, in a great way in his book called The Tender Warrior. The first trial that David had was an enemy that he could not master. David was not allowed to kill the Lord's anointed. And unfortunately, this enemy of David's never went away. It wasn't like a Goliath that he could slay and be done with. It was a Saul who was always there that he could not kill. And unfortunately, this enemy 
of David would sometimes get the best of him, as we see here in this passage. It's because he was relentless. He was always seemingly present, and I couldn't help but think how true was David's trial to our trials today. We have an enemy that we cannot master. The flesh is always there. And though we may grow in grace, and though we may become more and more like the Son of God, we still face that old nature. He's seemingly ever-present. And at times, we grow weary. At times, we forget the promises of God. At times, we listen to our heart. At times, we grow frustrated that we cannot live the perfect life because we have lost sight of God's word and because we've lost sight of his promises, we become depressed in the heart. We feel like failures. Even though David had just celebrated a massive accomplishment, the heart is deceitful. David became victimized by the deadly force of depression. The second trial of our faith is seen by not only having an enemy that we cannot master, but David also had expectations that he could not meet. You see, David never asked those 600 men to come along with him. They joined themselves to him. They were the ones who came and said, David, take care of us. There is no doubt that the internal pressure to care for these men and their families in the wilderness as he was running was beginning to take its toll on David. And just as much as the external pressures that King Saul was applying on David, the trial of David's faith was revealing to David his lack of trust in the Lord. As a result, David began to rely upon his own logic, upon his own reasonings to save himself. And before you get too hard on King David, I ask you, have you ever had expectations that you could not meet? What did you want to do? Give up? Give in? And that's exactly what David was feeling. It was time to flee because he was tired and wore out from fighting. Understand this morning, outside circumstances don't cause depression. They only help you discover depression. Instead, depression originates from the deceitfulness of the heart. So how then do you overcome the deceitfulness of the heart? How do you have victory over depression? How can you overcome the feelings of your heart? The secret to that answer is eventually found three chapters later in 1 Samuel chapter 30, in verse 6 and 7, where David finally regains his faith in the word of God, and he inquires of the Lord like he used to before. 1 Samuel 30, in verse 6, records, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. The ephod was a special garment worn by the Old Testament high priest. It contained an instrument called the Urim and Thummim used to determine the will of God. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. In short, David's faith in the word of God returned. Fast forward, if you will, to the near end of the New Testament. And in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, the same strategy is given for success. The Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. This means that it is possible to overcome depression. The victory is our faith. Now, faith isn't the power of positive thinking. Romans 10, 17 tells us, where faith comes from. So then faith, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from God's word and it's faith that will overcome the deceitfulness of the heart. 
all the lies and all the deceitfulness that the heart can spew out will be challenged and overcome by the faith produced from the word of God. Think about that. Your heart will prod you to go the wrong way often, but faith in God's word can overcome that prodding. Your heart will condemn you when you're trying to go the right way. Faith in God's word will overcome that. 1 John 3.20 says, For if our heart condemn us, that's depression. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. My friends, tonight I wanted to expose the breeding grounds. This morning I wanted to expose the breeding grounds of depression. It is the heart of every person. I also aimed to give you a strategy to overcome the depressive lies of the heart. And that strategy is to fill your life to the brim with the word of God. Hear the word of God preached. It builds your faith. Read the word of God at home or in the dorm. It builds your faith. Speak the word of God to your friends. It builds your faith. Write the word of God in your journals. It builds your faith. Sing the word of God. Paint the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. It all builds your faith. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Are you, pre- are you depressed this morning? You'll need to overrule those lies with a strong portion of God's word. Because that builds your faith. And I close by saying that depression affects all of us. Every single one of us. In 1835, a man visited a doctor in Florence, Italy. He was filled with anxiety and exhausted from lack of sleep. He couldn't eat and he he avoided his friends. The doctor examined him and found that he was in prime physical condition, concluding that his patient needed to have a a good time. Ease up in life. Go enjoy yourself. The physician told him about a circus in town and its star performer, a clown named Grimaldi. Night after night, he had the people rolling in the aisles. You must go and see him, the doctor advised. Grimaldi is the world's funniest clown. He'll make you laugh and he'll cure your sadness. No, replied the despairing man. He can't help me. You see, I am Grimaldi. Some people will look at the wonderful personality of others. They see them laugh, joke, and tease and they always see their Facebook posts and they think depression doesn't affect them. But the truth is that the person who may be laughing out loud is really crying within. I know I've been that person. Depression doesn't always look like doom and gloom, but it always lives in doom and gloom. It causes us to lose sight of the promises of God, the deceitfulness of the heart. That's all depression is. It's when you lose sight of God's word.